thanks for this invitation for the brilliant opportunity to attend this scope of presentations that Itma has been putting together. While there is some interdictality here slipping in form of a paper that is making the microphone slip, I want to emphasize that maybe I'm talking while we had a session about liveliness of data to a liveness of data maybe in this session. And a great part of my research has been concerned with how different media techniques recently, including biomedia, have been partaking in staging aliveness, producing authenticity while promising real body presence. And the use of biomedia as a means of artistic expression takes advantage of a high degree of non-fictious believability, truthfulness, corporality of their status as real biological entities, potentially stemming from life, uh, resembling the viewers of art themselves, but while their real apparent or at least potential aliveness first prompts feeling of immediacy, the underlying mediality and technological constructiveness of these displays is often cryptical, revealed, and addressed. So generally, two strategies in this bio-art, like many people call it, is pre uh, prevailing. The first one draws on the well-established mechanisms in history that is illusionism, the simulation of an authentic presence that appears to share a space with the viewer that seems to be unmediated, right? And the second one, when bodily presences are captured, is indexicality, which acknowledges that the production of evidence from traces obeys sign modalities and hence induces degrees of representation. And in this sense, media claiming to give access to the real will be particularly scrutinized and the so-called DNA fingerprint analyzed against the backdrop of the imprint and photography, mechanically reproducing media that were considered authentic, especially when they fulfill the task of authenticating the objectivity or truthfulness, high fidelity of medial projects as non-medial. That means to erase the trace of the medium within the medial trace itself. And I'm quoting here um, media art scholars um, Michael Wetzel. As we will see while deconstructing uncritically accepted metaphors, such as the genetic fingerprint, it is particularly important to split hairs. While Charles Sanders Peirce's science trichotomy is today largely extended to the grid for media analysis, I will pick up his own designation of the indexical science dual character to contextualize the fragility of such presumably natural science that are indexes. So traces and their cultural interpretations are often being said to having favored the emergence of pictograms and written language, while in the anthropology of the image or built anthropology, it is argued that the birth of images is related to the desire to replace that what vanished, materializing the Greek eidolon into form to be perceived, the image becoming the presence of an absence, such as of a death mark. And Georges Dide Übermann, who organized the most remarkable cross-historical exhibition on the imprint, L'Empreinte, in, uh, in 1997 at the Centre Georges Pompidou in Paris, speaks of a constant interplay, quote, between the made imprint and the imitated imprint, from prehistory to modern and contemporary art. According to Dide Übermann, the imprint has always been not only a process, but also a motif, whereby process itself is depicted as motif, taking the form of imitated imprints. And an imprint is especially misleading because in it, as um, Didi Übermann says, the optical and tactile, the image and its process, sameness and its alteration are immediately bound together, presenting the danger of confounding a mind, which for reason of its own clarity and powers of decision, is automatically inclined to separate contradictory information. So he sees in the persistence of the indexical and what he says an anachronistic necessity because it constitutes, quote, the dawn of images as such, involving both the optic and the tactile, the materiality of the signifier matters. 
in the literal sense, creating a malaise in interpretation and in representation, which functions as a critical tool, such as employed as a critique of the retinal focus of art such as centrally followed through in many of Marcel Duchamp's work, unfolding both as touching which is negatives of body positives or traces of air. It is worth here to briefly recall the three sign modalities developed by philosopher and logician Charles Sanders Peirce in his seminal essay, What is Sign from 1890 and a series of subsequent other texts. So to make it short, and not to repeat it all, the index, as opposed to the symbol and the icon, establishes its relationship between the signifier and the signified by means of a shared materiality or an actual connection, anchoring the traces of the production in the mediated representation. So symbols, according to peers, are arbitrary, purely conventional, general signs, and evolve through usage are agreed upon. A symbol, quote, is connected with this object by virtue of the idea of the symbol using mind. It is to be interpreted thus and not otherwise, and its meaning lies in nothing but the very fact of there being a habit. This applies to words and symbolic images. I can then bear visual analogy of formal similarity to the object they depict, and their likeness um, conveys the idea of the things simply by imitating them. The index, by contrast, is a sign connected to its object physically and through a shared mediality, and therefore indicates the object as a representanum, quote, which fulfills the function of a representamen by virtue of a character which it could not have if its object did not exist. So no smoke without fire, no footprint unless somebody has walked there. As indications, they create strong direct attention to the objects by what he calls blind compulsion. They act directly up in the nerves of the person, and there it stops, since it does not describe the qualities of its object. But it may create evidence for other symbolic constructions, such as religious text, what he writes, what the Bible is, must be shown by indices. Now, it is intriguing that Peirce himself um, um, designs the indexical science dual character, differentiating between genuine and degenerate science. The genuine index unfolds as a non-intentional natural sign, a physical symptom such as, for example, a symptom of disease or an expansion of mercury in a thermometer, an index that has an essential relation, a natural contiguity, but then cannot follow through. Therefore, a degenerate index is needed in order to intentionally point to the phenomenon in a way the perceiver can make use of it. This can be the little man with an umbrella coming out of a hygrometer when it's wet, for example. That is an, uh, a symbolic and an iconical sign. But between the Genuine and the generate index, there is no automatic contiguity. There is a rupture. While the generative index takes on habits that directs him already towards the iconic and the symbolic. In the sense, it's remarkable that Pierce, in different texts, lists photography both among the iconic and the indexical. Now, on the other hand, when Regis Debré picks up this trichotomy in his Three Ages of Looking, he classifies the Greek icon, nevertheless, as indexical, because by its virtue of having miraculous properties and its magical value to pass pro toto embodies a saint. And he even parallels the degenerate index on purpose with a genuine index that, for example, authentic religious relics, remnants, and religious traces can be considered as. Now, Debré sees a circular logic uh, at work among the respective predominance of these categories of science over time, leading to cultural shifts which are indeed grounded in the evolution of technical media. Greek or Roman art takes us from the index to the icon. Modern art from the icon to the symbol. In the area of the visual, the loop of contemporary art reverses itself and turns away from everything symbolic in a desperate quest for the index. And I think this is probably why we are also here today. 
Now, with regards to photography, Pierce indeed contends that the photographic medium not only excites an image, has an appearance, but owing its optical connection with an object, is evident that the appearance corresponds to a reality, hence ascribing the degenerate index quality to the genuine index. In contrast, Didier Übermann insists on the very difference between genuine and degenerate qualities because, quote, the imprint transmits physically and not just optically the semblance of the imprinted object or being. Here, the um, epistemological rich example of the famous Shroud of Turin comes to mind. This piece of linen considered as a relic in the Cathedral of Saint Jean in Turin is claimed to be the burial shroud of Jesus of Nazareth, supposedly bearing his bodily imprint with traces consistent with the According to its proponents, it should be considered an archaeopoeta, a religious icon allegedly not made by human hands. But there's uncertainty of whether it really presents a direct imprint of Christ's body, or if it only emulates that trace. Theologians and scientists have presented many for both authenticity and possible methods of forgery. It is not surprising that a great number of iconic depictions of the whale exist from the 17th century and radiocarbon dating tests have established its origin in the medieval period only between the 13th and the 14th century. However, what is more remarkable, and that's why I'm quoting it here, is that from the perspective of media art history, the shroud was considered more authentic in the eye of the public when first photographed in 1898. Here, the negatives of the photographic image rendered the appearance of a positive image, thus implying that the shroud could effectively be a negative form from a yet more ancient mechanical reproduction technique. And we have here a kind of superimposed indexicality in which one instance of a degenerate index seems to authenticate a religious icon that claims to be of the kind of a genuine indexicality, that of a natural, uh, natural sign. In other cases, the medium of photography itself is being authenticated by parasites, nowadays called as glitches. Literal natural signs. Flies here. In this photograph from 1870, a fly being trapped in the very chamber of the camera produces a photogram, technically speaking, an imprint. And the fly collides with the photographic shot and brings something from the real world into the reproduction, transfers it to the picture in the form of a trace. By its genuine and unintentional character, it therefore provides evidence to the generate optical index, especially since no living activity can be seen in the photograph due to the long necessary exposition time uh, in this period when photographic processes still did not allow yet for capturing movement. So the fly is the only living element in this whole process here. Even before flies as motifs had, had a central role as intentional signs with regards to illusionism, media theorists have often pointed to the role of flies in still life paintings while on this symbolic level, they signify impermanence and the transitory nature of human life. On the aesthetic level, they constitute an instance of hyperrealism. The flies themselves do not sit on the other objects within the painting, but they sit on the surface of the painting itself. One is tempted to wave them away or to squash them. Between aesthesis and semiosis, they are less represent objects than they may be abjects of presence. And in many cases, they are even slightly overscaled in order to stand out. Rather than being part of the painted image, they emphasize painting as medium. It's understandable then that the fly, both as a material medium, reappears in contemporary art as a producer of ephemeral traces in two Greenford's case, and as a dead material overlaying the image of the Shroud of Turin in Harald Fuchs's case. It's validating Regis de Bries' statement that the loop of contemporary art reverses itself and turns away from everything symbolic in a desperate quest for the index. Now, Beato's photograph of the Mameli graves in Egypt with the trapped fly remaining motionless trace in the picture points to the trope of unmotivatedness or lack of intention that already William 
Henry Fox Talbot himself addressed when claiming photography as the pencil of nature. Quote, it frequently happens, and this is one of the charms of photography, that the operator himself discovers an examination, perhaps long times afterwards, that he has depicted many things he had no notion of at the time. Sometimes questions and dates are found upon the buildings or printed placards most irrelevant or discovered upon their walls. Sometimes a distant dial plate is seen and upon it unconsciously recorded the hour of the day at which the view was taken. Now, in the digital age and perversive photoshopping, the actual linkage between data and object is evident to be lost, and in technical terms, these multiple intermediary steps are clear to the average user. However, and as Dietmar Oppenhuber and Orkant Hellan write, quote, the perversive power of indexical displays is tightly coupled to their ephemerality. They are performative and show mechanisms and causalities rather than produce data. So genuine and degenerate indexicality are fully separated and its relation abstracted, which, quote, can get manifested as either a lack of critical scrutiny of the origins and qualities of the data, or, on the contrary, a distrust and outright dismissal due to its generative processes. It is precisely then with this ephemerality and performativity that Julius von Bismarck plays with his artistic intervention device called image fulgurator. Appearingly, being a camera, the fulgurator produces interventions in the photographs of others, generating an extremely rapid flash production of a symbolic image into photographs being taken by others by detecting camera flashes of digital photo cameras in the very moment the images are being taken. The insertion of such signs remains invisible and only noticeable on the final image. The person taking the image then discovers, when verifying the shot, the parasite image, echoing Talbot's assumption that the operator himself discovers on examination that he has depicted many things he had no notion of at the time. Making use of these charms of photography here, van Bismarck plays with intentionally introduced lack of intention. So the notion of unmotivativeness, otherwise a qualifier for genuine index, and takes advantage of the ephemerality of the index as a fragile sign. And now we move to the living images as such because here we have a piece by artists Heather Aykroyd and Dan Harway employing live biotechnological media to further confuse index, icon, and symbol, taking the pencil of nature literally 150 years after. Inspired by Talbot's image of a ladder leaning against a haystack, they produce images grown by the green scales of single living blades of grass of so-called stay green mutations. While in Talbot's photography, the latter only produces a shadow, the prolonged lack of sunlight may produce yellowing and chlorophyll breakdown affecting photosynthesis. Genuine indexes, so to say, an effect that the artist then used to project motifs on large arrays of young grass braids that then become carriers of iconic images symbolizing the ephemerality of the human nature, therefore inducing intentionality into the genuine index so to better degenerate it. Quite complex. What we see here is the complexification of sign relationships due to driving forces of evolution that have been described by J. David Bolter and Richard Grusin is remediation. The process whereby new media define themselves by borrowing from or overwriting prior media and vice versa. This suggests the belief that newly introduced media fulfill better the goal of authenticity, presence, and real experience by reforming all the media. Accordingly, a medium is that what remediates. It is what which appropriates the techniques, forms, and social significance of other media and attempts to rival and refashion them in the name of the real. Assuming that one motivation of art employing biotechnology today is to benefit from biomedia's potential to allude to the authentic living or real bodiliness, it's fruitful to examine which earlier media strategies they update and um, which actual artworks they make reference to. And for this purpose, I've developed a theory of biomediality according to which all examples of biomedial artworks are classified in 
divided in three functional categories. First, we can speak of media in the sense of milieu uh, as an enabling condition which solicits changes in living beings or organic entities, already outlined in Lamarck's zoological philosophy, but echoed also in today's gross media, in tissue and for example, and we had the example of metaxy and in between this in the case of Max Ernst's definition of media. Second, we have media in the sense of means of transformation or generation that shifts the ability to transmit, store, and process information into the biological realm, making use of living systems' internal mechanisms, such as in GMOs, bioinformatics, or DNA synthesizing prototypes. And we have a third category, which is media in the sense of instances of measure in line with traditional media of perception and analysis, such as optical or other physical instruments, but in which here, as a contrast, one biological entity is measuring another, let's say in, bio, in gel electrophoresis, DNA chips, or biomarkers, and so on. And it's on the latter of these three categories I'm going to focus on, since it's quite linked to the, directly to the sign category of indexicality. And I have um, one uh, or two examples here. And this is precisely where there is a strong importance of splitting hairs. Um, precisely collected hair, cigarette butts and chewing gum from the streets of New York are the starting point for Heather Dewey Hackbox project Stranger Visions in order to extract DNA from the samples and then compare the found sequences via bioinformatics uh, to check whether to correspond or whether they correspond to physical traits of the persons having left these traces behind. In a hyper-realist, although openly exaggerated manner, she extrapolates this data to produce realistic 3D portraits of how these strangers may look like, thus giving a face to abstract issues connected to genetic privacy. Speaking with peers, genuine and degenerate index are totally uncoupled here, while the numerous intermediary technical steps of deduction are black box but having a perfect icon as a result with a maximal likeliness with regards to the actual person. But in the light of the perpetual desire to artificially produce signs of evidence, what comes more immediately to mind than the fingerprint, and be it the genetic fingerprint, is an artistic fake. So Paul Vanu's performative installations late in figure prototype unfold as a semiotic artistic puzzle with biomedia. Yeah, five. <laughs> From the mindset of a politically motivated technical media artist, he inverts the indexicality inherent in the very notion of a DNA fingerprint, which precisely, as opposed to a classic dactyloscopic fingerprint, is not an imprint but a trace of the body in the form of blood, spits, sperm, or hair, which then is being manipulated through many steps of standard lab procedures. In fact, it doesn't need to come from the finger at all and splitting hairs. One might even note that while genetic fingerprinting creates a profile based on this material carrier of genetic information presented in the, in the trace of a body, this profile is determined not on the basis of protein coding regions of DNA, but instead on the basis of individually varying mini-satellites in the non-coding sections of DNA. So splitting hair, it's even not genetic in this sense. In the latent figure protocol, the standard logic of making visible the banding patterns created by gel electrophoresis is inverted. Genetic lab models are used for synthesis, and figurative images are created from known DNA symbols instead of the customary abstract banding patterns from unknown DNA samples. So, Vanus generates iconic images, which are symbolically highly charged, such as ID, number one, um, the copyright, uh, the chicken and the egg, or the skull and crossbones, by treating each lane of the gel as a roll of pixels um, composed of DNA fragments and creating a two-dimensional grid of bands resembling a low-resolution bitmap image. So Vanus wants to downgrade the scientific authority of the indexical and allegedly objective DNA fingerprint to the status of a subjective portrait made by the artist's hands. We have other uh, uh, artworks by Paul Vanus, and maybe I should shut the, the closest a little bit down, but what is interesting 
that many of them relate to photography. Here we have um, the relative velocity inscription device, which is marrying the fitness of a skin color genes of its own multiracial family that is testing the fitness by running the gene sample on a gel electrophoresis gel. But the racing genes, uh, they appear in four tracks as red sticker figures. And of course, you may have guessed that they are in fact coming from Muybridge running man. So if in the second half of the 19th century, Mulbridge used photography to dissect locomotion to reveal its underlying anatomical principles, Van Nuys resembles the photographic constituents and reanimates them into an iconic moving image. But in reassembling Mulbridge individual images, however, here is a body perceived in saccadic motion, a movement, a movement, with, a movement with noise that suggests a body conceived bottom up on the basis of genes is nothing more than a schematic noisy model. So yet photography is remediated for other reasons because photography was appreciated also as an objective mechanical method in physiognomy and eugenics. Therefore, the installation also contains a copy of Charles Davenport's Race Crossing in Jamaica from 1929, which provided objective evidence for the argument for a strict separation of races and maintains the inferiority of black-white hybrids. And behind Davenport, Vanus targets the founder of genetics, Sir Francis Galton, also known as the originator of dactyloscopy. The goal of the biomedical studies of papillary riches, however, was less to differentiate individuals than it was to provide a means of categorizing races. His fingerprinting technique developed in 1892 aimed at reducing the amount of analytic biometric data in the then current anthropometric measurements. But when the results proved insightful, uninsightful, excuse me, Galton was disillusioned and turned once more again to photography, becoming obsessed with deducing stereotypes of populations from his so-called composite photography. These composites were then made by overlapping multiple exposures of individual portraits, blending them into a single image, which subsumed individual physiognomic features, foregrounding those the subjects held in common, and thus were purported to capture particular, uh, particular human and racial stereotypes. And it comes at no surprise then that Vanus engages even further in what being considered molecular photoshopping and that we staged together in an exhibition in 2011 called Fingerprints, and this also contains a flipbook in the terms of uh, to phrase his images as a flipbook, um, when he created a suspect immersion center, immersion center as a functional public lab where one can witness live the creation of genetic fingerprints from well criminal cases, such as the banding patterns in the DNA profile of uh, alleged murder and US American place uh, O.G. Simpson, which are painstakingly created here after a matter of weeks, but only using the artist's own DNA. So to conclude with here, in this example, reproducing O.G. Simpson's DNA profile using his own DNA sequences, however, goes beyond mere technological curiosity. By generating forced DNA profiles, Vanus points to the reciprocal influence of the media technological and the cultural upon another. In the case of the black US star, tried in court in 1994 for the murder of his white ex-wife and her new boyfriend, the defense won Simpson's acquittal on the basis of lack of evidence, despite the crushing weight of the prosecution's DNA tests because the defense team discredited the allegedly racist police officers, accusing them of planted fake blood traces. So Paul Van Nuys shows how media techniques that allegedly provide objective indexical data are not culturally neutral. And then the artist stresses the parallel to the manipulability of photographic the medium pointing to the alleged digital darkening of the New York Times magazine of the cover photograph of O.G. Simpson in order to make him look more criminal. As a conclusion, I think we have seen in this debate on indexicality that 
biomedia and art do not materialize as standalone media, but appear in an intermediate constellation alongside other physical, optical, or computational media. And in most cases, vexing media archaeological puzzles have to be solved to track down the visual, invisible, technical, epistemic elements in their distributed mediality. So these networks of media combination are no longer mere means to produce a single-layered optical effect, but often in their scattering of paratexts and discourses make up the very aesthetic entity themselves. So here, mediation and technologies are no longer implied merely to achieve an, aest uh, an aesthetic effect. They are themselves fully integrated elements in the aesthetic idiom. And I think this is one of the crucial points of what is probably concerned with indexical design and aesthetics. Thank you. <laughs>